My Hero Academia is a story based, obviously based off the title, on heroes. But what if Deku, Izuku Midoriya, our titular protagonist of the series, had instead another goal set before him? And that is what we'll be covering here today. Welcome to What If Deku Was a Spy. Hey Ross, sauce it up. It all begins several, several years before the original story of My Hero Academia, with Deku on his way to the Quirk Doctor. You see, in this version of My Hero Academia, when Deku goes with his mother to get his Quirk checked for to see if he has any power, by this point, Deku's already been indoctrinated by All Might's videos into making All Might out as some sort of god-like figure in Deku's mind. And just like the original My Hero Academia, Zuku would be told that he has no quirk. However, that was not the only test that Izuku was forced to take. You see, that day when he had been taken away for testing, it was around one to two hours. A mere ten minutes of that actually being a test to see if Deku had a quirk. The rest of it being a test by the Public Safety Commission. For those of you who are unaware of what that is, that is the government underbelly that raised and turned Hawks into the number two hero in the world of My Hero Academia in the actual show and manga. The Public Safety Commission would be looking for very specific children, testing their intelligence and deductive reasoning skills. This is a test that, unlike his quirk test, Deku would have flying colors in. Deku's deductive ability in My Hero Academia has always been above average, even if his combat ability itself was not. Deku himself being a master class level strategist when he has his tools set before him. But I digress. As I mentioned, Deku himself has been crushed. He had just been told that his quirk test was an absolute failure. However, they did find something else, as the doctor pulls forth some x-ray scans of Deku. He'd show that Deku actually has a tumor in his brain that is requiring surgery. Deku's mother being horrified as Inko has no idea what this could mean, asking what, what's going on, as they explain that it's incredibly dangerous and they need to get him into surgery as soon as possible. Of course, as they take Deku behind closed doors, there simply is no tumor, as Deku would be sweeped away by the Public Safety Commission to be indoctrinated and trained in the Children's Division, the same as Hawks was all those years ago. Inko would never see her son again, with her being told that her son had died in surgery being shown an expertly made body double. Inko would be devastated, not knowing how or why her baby boy had died so suddenly, how this could have happened, how, how they hadn't seen any signs, how it just, just happened all of a sudden. Inko would be confused and eventually cast aside as the Public Safety Commission had now collected what they were looking for. From this point on, our perspective will be following that of a young Izuku Midoriya. Uh, where are we going, Doctor? Izuku would ask. The doctor, chuckling, explained to Izuku that they're heading somewhere for very special children. As Deku would try pulling his hand away, saying he wants to see his mom, having been walking for a while now. At this point is where three men in full white suits with black visors covering their eyes would appear as they pick up and grab Deku, Deku now being unable to scream, move, or say anything, as Deku would be forced to be crying out for All Might to save him. No one could hear his cries, no one would be coming to save him, as Deku is dropped into the white room, the location where all of the kids are kept while they're not being forced into testing. Deku would rub his eyes waking up, realizing that he'd been asleep, as he looks down seeing that he's wearing the same clothes as everyone else. It would just be a flat white shirt with gray pants. Deku could even see kids younger and older than him, as he wonders what's going on. It's as Deku's looking around that someone would tap him on the shoulder from behind, as he turns seeing a boy a bit taller and definitely older than him, who would have bright red wings. Deku would be mesmerized, asking what his quirk is, this making the boy take a step back. Huh? <laughs> You're asking about that before my name? Gee, that's weird. You don't have that many friends, do you? Deku would look up saying, I, I have plenty of friends, like Kachan and, uh, 
the other background characters. Uh-huh, sure thing, kid. Well, I guess I'll introduce myself first, then. My name's Keigo. Keigo Takami. T takami It's nice to meet you. I'm... I'm Izuku Midoriya. The blind boy would quickly turn, telling him to be quiet, as he says that he doesn't want other people to hear their names too loudly. As Deku would be wondering why, he turns suddenly as he sees one of those strange, tall men come into the room. Takami would explain to Izuku, as saying that our names are worthless here. If they hear you identify yourself with your real name, then they'll... Deku would be shocked as he sees right in front of him, exactly as Takami says. The child in front of him would have a burn mark implanted on their skin with a number. As we see a brand being pressed into their arm, the kid screaming, as Deku would cover his mouth. Deku would whisper, How long have you been here? Hawks would smile, saying, <laughs> My whole life. It's here that we now begin to see a friendship develop between Deku and Hawks. Hawks only taking interest in Deku because of one thing. He's never seen only one kid come in at a time. That means just like him, Deku had been screened and had passed the test. Anyway, the real test had already begun, as the children would then be forced to take multiple standardized tests every single day. After these tests would begin training, being forced to do workouts, work with their quirks, or in the case of Izuku and other quirkless, learn how to use weapons. While Hawks would be focusing on learning how to use his wings and his feathers ability, Izuku would be focused on trying to survive in his own way, learning about what type of weapon he could use, trying different things. At first, Deku wanted to use a sword since little kid, swords are cool, but he could barely even pick it up, not even being able to swing it around, as he just holds it before it falls to the ground, clattering on the stone. Whenever they weren't training, Izuku would talk to Takami, Hawks, as I'll be referring to him from this point forth, all about All Might as he tells Hawks everything he ever had watched on the screen of how All Might he's sure is going to come save them, Deku having this light in his eyes. Hawks would simply turn away smiling as he says, you should keep dreaming that, as the testing will continue. After the first year of them being there, Izuka had begun being taught Judo, Taekwondo, Kung Fu, and almost any other hand-to-hand -hand combat that they could throw at him mixing and matching to see which one would be best for him, as Izuku would quickly be getting the handle of hand-to-hand -hand combat with a sparring partner, typically of course that partner being Hawks. This would not last very long, as all of the kids would begin getting called. Each standardized test, whoever had the lowest score, would disappear in the middle of the night, the kids having no idea what's going on. Hawks and Deku though would already know what's happening, the weak are getting called off, they're pulling the cream of the crop now, is what Hawks would be saying. Deku nodding. Hawks, during this entire last year, has been trained intensely, working on how to control his wings with precision, just like he had in the original timeline. Deku, on the other hand, being forced to train in all types of martial arts, and how to use weapons like daggers, throwing knives, hidden firearms like pistols, or sometimes even things like grenades or flashbangs. And eventually, the day had come. Hawks was scheduled to take his final test, as Hawks after taking his test would leave and never return. Zuku's older brother and who had become his best friend disappearing in a single night. Deku gulped, promising that he'd survive for the both of them, telling Hawks that even though he's gone, he's, he's going to live on for him. As Deku would train his deductive ability even harder, mastering parkour as well as hand-to-hand -hand combat throughout the next several years, as we now see Azuku Midoriya at the age of middle school, the same age that Hawks had been when he had disappeared. A majority of the kids Deku had seen in the room at this point had all been switched out and changed, to the point where Deku is now the one next in line. The one next set in line to graduate under the tutorage of the Public Safety Commission. And so, his final testing day would come, Deku one night being taken away as he disappears just like all of the other kids had when he was growing up. Deku would open his eyes, feeling like it was morning, well, never really knowing since he hasn't seen a morning in so long anyway, as he'd be then to explained by a proctor that he would be taking two sections of the exam, a written exam and an exam on the field. Huh? Deku would be confused, having no idea this is the test? Then did Hawks... 
Wait, he could be, he could still be alive. Deku and Hawks had always predicted that if the test had been a success that they would have been returned to the white room. But what if, what if they let them leave after they pass? Deku would gulp thinking this, this might be my only chance as Deku would harden himself to take the test. The written exam would be fairly easy for Deku to accomplish, as he simply has to understand how to do all the principles, math equations, English and grammar, Japanese, other similar topics, as well as some deductive questions, all of which this Deku can easily navigate through with no issue. 100%. And after completing the written exam, which took about one and a half to two hours, Deku would then be instructed to stand from his desk, as suddenly the entire room would turn dark. As the light turns on, Deku's desk would have sunk into the floor as well as his chair, as the entire room began moving upwards. Are we in an elevator, Deku would be thinking? With the Deku rising out of the elevator as the doors at the top open, Deku stepping out as he sees that he's on top of a building, and it's nighttime. Deku would find in front of him an earpiece and a silencer pistol. Deku would read the instructions inscribed as he places the earpiece in his right ear listening to see what they have to say. Agent 9, this will be your first on-field test. On the ground we have 30 men, all placed, looking for you. They have no idea where you've come out of, excited that's in here in Camino Ward. You'll be making your way to the center of the Camino Ward. After arriving through the city without being captured or seen, or damaged in any way, you must retrieve the object we desire, as we've enclosed in the files before you. You have 07 hours. We'll see you in the morning. Deku would come to realize that his designation as 009 when he was in the White Room was now his agent title, Agent 9. Deku would open the files in front of him and begin reading, as the files explained to him the purpose of his enlistment. His role as the heroes behind the scenes, the people who keep Japan and the world running as a spy. A spy? Deku would be thinking. As Deku would be thinking about what this even means, as suddenly alarms would be blaring all over the ward. Tch, I gotta get going. Deku wouldn't consider it no longer, simply wanting to get out of that room. Deku would grab the silencer pistol as he then runs down the emergency fire escape stairs, leaping off as he leaps from rooftop to rooftop using his terrain and parkour skills that he's gained over the years. Deku would have his silencer pistol, quote unquote, on a stunned safety mode filled with tranquilizers, so that he wouldn't accidentally be killing any of the Public Safety Commission's men. Deku would suddenly spot one, moving down the alleyway, looking around, carefully. Deku almost missed him after seeing just the faintest bit of light in his eyes, as he sees that this guy's dressed in all black to hide in the camouflage. Deku is, of course, still wearing the same outfit that is in the white room, which is a white shirt and gray pants. Obviously, Deku would think this is not a great match. Deku would use a tranquilizer, getting a perfect shot, as he then climbs and descends the building, taking and stripping the man of his clothes and switching out, now in a darker, more uniform outfit, as well as matching with his pursuers. The area was blocked off from civilians because of construction, so obviously there wouldn't be any civilians for Deku to worry about, or use to hide. Deku would take advantage of the situation, as he then climbs back to the top of the rooftop, but as he's about to reach for the final brick, Deku could hear footsteps. Deku would drop down to the next level as he breaks into the window, making a loud sound. Immediately he'd hear a mumbling voice, hearing a radio signal from someone else above him. As Deku then runs through the building, he'd make it to the other side before someone else enters into the room. Deku would immediately turn his arm without even looking back and shoot where the noise is coming from, immediately hearing a slumping sound as whatever had just walked past him was now on the ground unconscious. Two down, 28 left. Immediately as he exits out of the building, now on the ground floor, he would hear someone and sense them coming. Deku would turn, not having time to use his pistol since they're way too close, and would switch to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat, pistol whipping the guy in the face. As he's about to call out for help, Deku would silence him, choking around him as he wraps his legs around him and squeezes his neck with his hands. Agent 9 squeezing harder and harder, the person whose neck his hands were squeezing, falling unconscious. As Deku would leave him there, now moving forward towards the center of the Camino ward. Eventually, Deku would arrive at the center tower, where a majority of the people were stationed who were there looking for him. It would be here where Deku comes up with a plan. As we watch from the enemy's perspective, suddenly a car would start moving towards them. 
What the? Where did it even? The car would break into the building, exploding, as all of the people on the ground floor and in the higher floors would turn their attention towards the explosion. As they cleared the car, they'd realize that there's no person inside. It was just clothes stuffed with plastic bags and trash from the side of the road. And while they were all distracted, Deku had already made his way smoothly into the building, now climbing through an air shaft as he had arrived at the center vault of the tower, slowly making his way into the room as he sees a single glove, a glove for your right hand, sitting in the center of the room, the glove having the text engraved on the metal case in which it was held, quote unquote, diamond. Deku would shatter the case with his gun, shooting the glass as it shatters, grabbing the glove and making his quick escape. As he runs, people now climbing the stairs, Deku would make it to the rooftop, Deku not being cornered as people had ascended the stairs would have two options, fight or try to escape. Deku would gaze over the edge of the building, seeing the 34 floor drop beneath him. Deku turning towards the stairwell as he pulls the oddly heavy glove onto his hand. The reason of course for this glove being codenamed Diamond is because of the insane cost the government had put into making it. The ultimate support item, costing over 1 billion in US dollars to create, and over 10 years in development and building and testing. This is version 1 of Diamond, the first nanotech technology that Japan has ever created. And now, the first anti-quirk weapon in Japan. Deku would jump off the side of the building, escaping the fight, as he slams his hand into the side of the building, the nanotech obeying his command, as the glove would slowly gain magnetism from the friction as he slows down the side of the building, making it just to the bottom without any scratches, the glove being perfectly fine as it rebuilds itself to its original form. Deku smirking as it worked. Deku would run, making his way up to the top of the tower where he had originally gotten his assignment, having now successfully stolen, quote unquote, what he was supposed to retrieve. As he arrives, the Public Safety Commission would have already prepared his success letter. As Agent Nairobi offered two options, suddenly two floodlights would come on to him as he's reading this, looking around Deku would have his handout prepared. However, you'd see there'd be 40 armed soldiers, all of AK-47s, all pointed at his chest. As Deku finishes reading the letter, you have two choices Agent Nine: death or continue to live on and work for your country as a spy. Deku would smile, obviously knowing what his choice is. As Deku would then be debriefed on his mission, his mission to enter UA High as a potential hero candidate in Class 1A, and to find and smoke out the potential mole sent in from All For One's terrorist organization that one of their operatives has deemed will be entering into UA, although they have no idea who it could possibly be. Deku will be forced to investigate not only Class 1A, but Class 1B, Class C, as well as the support group classes as well effectively the entire year that he'll be entering with. All while avoiding suspicion from teachers or being found out by any of the staff at UA. It's from here where we see a new Izuka Midoriya several months later, with the UA entrance exam now taking place as he's walking in to take the exam. His hair color changed in order to hide his identity as Agent 9 walks forward to take the UA entrance exam for the number one top hero school in the world. You all might have been wondering where I was in this video. Well, let me tell you. As of about a week ago, me and Weeb discussed each other creating a random series on each other's channel that we both had to finish regardless of what it was, and this is what Weeb laid out for me. So I have been working on this and my artist, I Care on Instagram has been working on art so that I can use for this series. As you guys can see from the thumbnail, that's what Deku's going to be looking like in this version of events and that's going to be his secret disguise. He dyes his hair black and his eyes are the color of like a red. He wears like these reddish contacts. Not only that, but since you guys missed out on a video from me specifically today, I'm going to be pointing you guys towards the right direction. That one Weeb's channel in the link down below and in the comment section will be having a link to the video that I will be participating in. Which is going to be what if Tsunade adopted Naruto, where Naruto was going to be part Senju via the relationship that he is going to be having to Tsunade. So if you guys are excited for that and excited for that one Weeb's take on that series, then please make sure to go back to his channel and click on that video, leave a like on it, as well as leaving a like on this one. And also, uh, just, just to sign out, I just have to quickly really, really say it. Like for part two!